Our teacher, Bhikshuni Lozong Yotun, is an American born Buddhist nun who's been practicing since 1994, and she was ordained actually in 2003. Uh, she moved here from, to Chenrezig, um, from here to Chenrezig Institute in Australia and studied for many years under Rinpoche Geshe Tashi Sering at the Larampa Geshe. He's the Larampa Geshe from Sarah Monastery and former abbot of Kiyome Tentric College. Um, she went on to study and retreat and offer services around the world. We're very uh, pleased and honored to have her here teaching our program. Um, as part of our tradition, there will be an opportunity at the end of the program to make an offering to the center, as well as individually to the teacher. And we're going to give you that information at the end of the last program and post the appropriate links in the chat. Um, please be aware that we are recording this teaching. If you do not want to be on camera, please write your question in the chat to Venerable Yunten. If you have discussed something personal that you want to keep private, um, you can let Venerable Yunten or myself know and we'll uh, edit it out of the final video. Um, it's also best while attending programs um, to imagine that you're actually in the meditation space. So please show appropriate respect for these precious teachings by following some simple guidelines. Um, please sit in a comfortable manner and refrain from lying down in bed unless you have a disability or illness. Please do not eat during teachings or drink loudly. Please turn off your camera if you are moving around, but otherwise, please keep your video on to help facilitate a better group experience. And it also helps in regards to the drinking loudly just to keep yourself muted when uh, you're not asking a question. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna hand this off to Venerable Yunten. Thank you so much, Christina. Uh, welcome everybody. So we're looking at the six perfections and today we're specifically looking at patience. Thank so um, brace yourself <laughs> and uh, we'll start as always by setting our motivation. So if you wanna just get yourself in a contemplative headspace and a steady and grounded posture. So just thinking that we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of generosity through the guideline teaching for enhancing the mind that gives without attachment namely transforming our bodies, wealth, and collection of virtue over the three times into the objects desired by each and every sentient being. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of moral discipline, working for the sake of sentient beings enacting virtuous deeds and not transgressing the bounds of the Pratimoksha, Bodhisattva, and Tantric vows, even at the cost of our lives. Should even the myriad beings of the three realms without exception become angry at us, humiliate, criticize, threaten, or even kill us, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of patience not to be distraught, but to work for their benefit in response to their harm. Even if we must remain for an ocean of eons in the fiery hells of Avicii for the sake of one sentient being alone, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of joyous effort, to strive with compassion for supreme enlightenment and not to be discouraged. Having abandoned the faults of dullness, agitation, and mental wandering, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of meditative concentration through the samadhi of single-pointed placement upon the nature of reality, which is that all things are void of true existence. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of wisdom through the space-like yoga of single-minded placement upon ultimate truth, conjoined with the ecstasy and great bliss induced by the discriminating wisdom analyzing suchness. We seek your blessings to perfect samadhi on illusion by realizing how external phenomena lack true existence yet still appear, like a mirage, a dream, or the image of the moon on a still lake. Samsara and Nirvana lack even an atom of true existence, while cause and effect and dependent arising are unfailing. We seek your blessings to discern the import of Nagajuna's thought, which is that these two are complementary and not contradictory. And so we go for refuge until we're enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. 
by our merits from giving and other perfections, may we become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. Sangye chudan sogi chunamla janju badu dani kapsu chi dagi jin sogi pe sonam ki rola tenji sangye rupa sho sangye chudan sogi chunamla janju badu dani kapsu chi dagi jin sogi pe sonam ki and so just let your motivation sink in. Whatever initially brought you here to this class today, consciously expanding and deepening to be more than yourself, more than just today, hopefully with bodhicitta. Okay, so when we're looking at the six perfections, so far we've gone through the first two. <clears throat> and just reminding us that perfection means going beyond the end or reaching perfection. So the aim of all of these practices is complete Buddhahood enlightenment. That's the aim. This state of perfection is becoming a Buddha, where all faults and sufferings are overcome and all qualities and happiness have been achieved. From this state, we are best able to benefit all sentient beings. So our reason for practicing paramita or perfections is to benefit all, including ourselves, by working towards our enlightenment. So when we look at these, these are very familiar concepts, generosity, ethics, patience, joyous effort, concentration, wisdom, these are very familiar but we're doing them for a very specific reason, and that reason is enlightenment. And if our reason is enlightenment, then the everyday practice of these leads to enlightenment, as well as helping the everyday matters, the everyday stress relief, the everyday conflict resolution, the everyday peace of mind. That gets settled as a byproduct, but you're not keeping your vision locked in to just getting through the day. You're aiming for the greatest goal, and the smallest goals get achieved day by day as well. So we're remembering that these are not just ways to be a good person or to be a committed citizen. These are ways to gather mental momentum to perfect your mind. And then you'll be a nice person too. Yeah. yeah. So when we look at patience, we're looking at forbearance with suffering. So the word patience is a word you've known since childhood. When you hear the word patience, what does it convey to you right away, right off the bat? Just colloquially, what is patience? In everyday language, yeah, go ahead. It means to wait. To wait. <laughs> to wait. Yeah. yeah. To wait, why? Um, for something that's good, maybe, or to be polite. Mm. Yeah, yep those connotations for sure. Yeah. 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 Patience. What else? What is it? Maybe sometimes not being angry. Yeah. Not being angry. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. John. Oh, sorry. It's like a state of mind, almost like acceptance. Yeah. It's like acceptance. That's a nice way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Laren. Yes, thank you. Bonjour, bonsoir. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, it's it maybe patient for me. Is, um, giving space mm -hmm. to some anger or some not being happy to manifest from yeah. the other person, yeah. and sometimes for me, yeah. Giving space. Yeah, that's a nice framing. Yeah, yeah, E? Sometimes when somebody tells you to have patience, it means they want you to wait for them and they're not ready. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yep. 
<laughs> or like make peace with my bad behavior or make peace with my delays. <laughs> yeah. Like when you see road construction and there's those signs that say expect delays, it's like a motto for life really, isn't it? Expect delays. <laughs> yeah, um, Angel, did you have one? Oh yeah, um, to me patience means um, to recognize that whatever the other person is doing that's bothering me, uh, I've done the same thing to someone else. So if I'm patient with them, that means they're gonna be hopefully they're going to recognize that what they're doing is not the right view. Mm. Yeah, there's something important in there about self-reflection, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, Janine? I think colloquially, it, it has a connotation of putting the other person before you. So mm -hmm. essentially, um, you know, maybe stuffing your own feelings. Right. And in, in for their, so that they stay happy. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's important to acknowledge that connotation, whether that's what we're actually aiming for or not. There is that connotation of like stuff it. <laughs> yeah. Or like squash it. Just like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for sure that comes up. Yeah. Uh, Tenzin. Or Charity, whoever pops in first. <laughs> He's pointing, but oh, I don't know. I was yeah, just thinking, um, maybe stillness. Stillness. Yeah, stillness with what? With the time and space that you have. Hmm. Maybe. Yeah, something there. Definitely something there. Yeah, yeah, Charity. I think the other lady kind of said what I was thinking, but I was thinking more of holding back because the mm. way my personality is, I'm, I tend to be very exuberant, no matter mm. what I'm talking about, no matter if I'm getting ready to have egg on my face. So <laughs> holding back for me is what patience means. Yeah, holding back, restraint. Yeah. Yeah, Eleanor. For me, patience means um, not being in a rush to do things, you know, mm. to be more reflective, to, because um, I'm a bit ripshit. Um, uh, you know, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, just to be patient and to be reflective before action. Personally, yeah. that's, yeah. Mm. Yep, yeah, 100% that. Yeah, anybody in the Gompa? <laughs> Variations of a theme. Yeah, so it's, it's like we get it, right? We get it. It's a thing in life that people tell us we should have. Um, sometimes we're on board, sometimes we're not, sometimes we can do it, sometimes we can't, but we have a general idea of patience. What do you think would be the benefit of patience? Just given your understanding so far, what does it prevent or protect? What's the benefit? It prevents me from uh, um generating bad karma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, yeah, Angel. Uh, for me, uh, one of the benefits is that it helps get that whatever point I'm trying to make, helps it get it across. Because yeah. I'm angry with a person, even though I'm trying to help them, they may not recognize me, uh, that I'm trying to help them. They may just think that these guys seem rude. Or whatever. Yeah, it's like it can really save the relationship because there's not that pushiness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a danger in being too patient? Is there a danger or is there a misapplication of patience that's maybe not the correct application, but is how we were taught? What's the, what's, I guess, the pitfall or the shadow side? Voice yeah, John. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh. yeah, John, go ahead. Then Andrea. Oh, my mind just went blank. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Um, Christina? Uh, I think that maybe one of the pitfalls or maybe it's just a, a, a incorrect projection or something, but like when you think you're being patient or you're labeling it patience, but really it's out of fear. So you're like mm -hmm. not moving or you're not doing anything, taking any action because you're just kind of stuck, like frozen. Yeah. Like and you're saying, oh, being patient. Yeah, yeah, I'm just being patient. <laughs> You're 
you're waiting, but it's because you're frozen. <laughs> yeah, right, for sure. Right. Like yeah. more based out of fear. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, Andrea, I sorry. Like to, I was thinking similar to that, like more of like a passivity or mm. an avoidance. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think this is, you know, we're grown ups, we get through our life, we know how to do things and then we forget. But like we know what patience is and we know where it could get problematic. I think that when we're looking at the Buddhist view of patience, we have to name what we already think, because otherwise we're gonna mix it so naturally that we won't even notice. Because there are things about patience in Buddhism that sound the same. And then there are things that are radically different and fascinating and far more empowering and powerful than kind of the, the basic surface understanding of patience. So just kind of like acknowledge that you have a relationship with this word already. You already have a relationship with this word and let's see if we can kind of tidy up the relationship or upgrade it in some way so that it's as functional as it can be and um, ideally become a perfection, but even if not, at least a bit more healthy. So um, from Lama Son Kappa, because it's always good to start with a solid traditional source that we can bank on. Lama Son Kappa says, perfecting patience means that you simply complete your conditioning to a state of mind wherein you have stopped your anger and the like. It is not contingent upon all living beings becoming free from undisciplined conduct because you would not be able to bring this about and because you accomplish your purpose just by disciplining your own mind. So there's something quite profound here, right? Like it's, it's not based on people responding well, right? Because if that were the case, we would never achieve the perfection of patience. Patience has little to do with people's, I guess, receptivity. It's completely an inner state of mind, which can then be something useful for people outside, but it's not necessarily something they're gonna be open to. Um, think about how sometimes if you've been enraged, maybe as a child or a teenager or just a really horrible day, if someone is very patient with your anger, sometimes it makes you more mad right? You're completely aggravated. You're like, how can you be so calm? This is really important. You know, so really like take this as an inner training less than an external behavior. The external behavior of patients can look a million different ways. It's an internal discipline where you've stopped anger and the like. So these words are difficult and we could kind of go the wrong road with them. So I'm just going to unpack those in a second, but just so you know, there's a few different kinds of patients, as you might expect, <laughs> right? So we have the patients when we're harmed by others. So when we are harmed bodily or mentally by others, we should not react by getting angry or harming them in return. And you're like, yep, that's great in a perfect world. Okay, <laughs> coming back to that. Patients when we're suffering is the other kind. And this is when we suffer, we point to someone or something outside ourselves as the cause. The immediate reason for our suffering may be something outside, but the deep or underlying cause is our own karma, which is of our own doing. So there's kind of patience in response to people, patience in response to pain. And there's a third type, but we'll talk about that later. So, we kind of have to like look at this, your anger. What is anger? Anger from a Buddhist perspective, okay, this is really important. From a Buddhist perspective, anger is the wish to harm. So it's not just being upset, okay? So when you hear about anger in Buddhism, know that that's our definition. So whenever we're saying, don't be angry this, don't be angry that, we're saying, don't have the wish to harm. Okay, so this is really important because otherwise you're gonna get tangled. Yes, so anger is the wish to harm, not simply being upset from a Buddhist perspective. There is being upset, but that's not anger. Yeah, go ahead. Being angry without having the thought of harming somebody. Is that different? It's different. Yeah, she was asking, um, is um, being angry without the wish to harm okay? And we'd have to unpack that a little bit more. Um, an agitated mind has an affliction brewing. It has a distortion of reality actively present. 
So it could be good information that something isn't right, either in your thinking or how things are going. It can be good information. But I guess what's, what's really important here is for all negative emotions, we have to remember that vividness is not a criteria for truth. If something is felt strongly, it doesn't mean it's real. If it's a visceral, powerful gut feeling in your mind or in your body, it's not necessarily accurate. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Vividness is not a criteria for truth. Okay, so feelings are not wisdom by their nature. And this is so important for us to understand. And it's difficult if initially we were taught not to listen to our feelings. And then as adults, we finally realized we should listen to our feelings and we got empowered and we were so happy to finally be able to hear ourselves. We could go too far the wrong way. So 100% you need to know what you're feeling. 100% you need to feel what you're feeling. Don't suppress it, right? But feelings themselves are not true or accurate in and of themselves, though some of the content that they're referring to might be accurate observations. But the agitation in the mind means that there might be an accurate observation, but there's definitely also a distortion present because a peaceful mind is much closer to wisdom. So how do you know how to trust yourself? Trust what your mind says when it's calmer, when it's more settled, when there's not this illusion of urgency. And it's very difficult because occasionally you need that urgency to get up and go and get things done and to right a wrong. But the urgency should be like Tara swift wisdom urgency of ready to leap to the aid of sentient beings. It shouldn't be a panicked problem solving. And, there's, and it's a really important difference to distinguish within yourself. What are the two forms of swiftness? Because you can be swift and quick and immediately responsive in a way that's totally wisdom. And if you think of yourself in those states back in your memories, when it's been wisdom, there's a calm even amongst your speed, isn't there? And you can, there's a clarity of vision and details. You know, I was, I was thinking about when I was 18, I was in a terrible car accident. And when the car was coming to hit me, time slowed down. We all have this maybe experience somewhere in our life when time slows down. And it was almost like my brain was like, you know what, everything else happening is not important right now. Just focus on the car is going to hit you. Yeah. And that because of that strength of focus, that was all that was seen. But that was all that was seen in incredible detail. You know, I could even see the glass breaking on the windshield, you know, crack by crack. You know, and this is how powerful our mind can be when it focuses in. So there was a calm because of the focus and the, strate the strategicness of what should I do about this is going to be really bad. You know, in whatever 20 seconds I only have to make a decision that's going to end my life or save it. Yeah. Whereas, you know, in another, you know, near death situation, horse related, horse related, <laughs> um, I was just really panicked and it was just by chance I didn't die. Yeah, I wasn't grounded, you know, I was just completely like the horse was stung by a wasp. There was a runaway train situation. It was very dramatic and, you know, and I really could have died, but I was just panicked and there was no calm there. Time didn't really slow down. It just kind of blurred and fuzzed into static. Okay, so use your memories to help you understand the parts of your mind to trust and reinforce and the parts of your mind to work on. Okay, so when, so when we're saying that anger is the wish to harm, that actually can be sort of subtle because we think of wish to harm as like, I'm gonna go beat up someone like on a playground, like we're five years old. The wish to harm could be very politely passive aggressive of for you, I will not smile. And I hope that that kind of hurts your feelings. That is the wish to harm. Yeah. I will punish you for your behavior by giving you my grumpy face. You know, Whereas, like as adults, we're sort of doing that. Like, mm -mm, no smile for you. That'll teach you. 
you know, <laughs> right? Variations on a theme. I don't know what we get up to. There's a change of tone of voice, or there's a bluntness or a speediness. It depends on your, you know, way of communicating. But there's ways in which we express displeasure that have little arrows in them. Yeah, that do have a wish to wound. They're just polite and socially acceptable. So you might say, oh, well, I don't ever have the wish to harm. I don't want to hurt anybody. And you're like, sure, generally that's true. You're a nice person. You don't want to hurt anyone. But how about, you know, yesterday in traffic when that guy wouldn't move at the green light and you honked, you kind of hoped that that would annoy their ears enough that they'd get going or be somehow told that their driving was unacceptable. You were punishing them with, their, with your horn, you know? So it's just, you know, it's an exercise of self-awareness. Don't let it trigger a whole shame flood, as always. Your afflictions are not you. They're just habits you've accumulated. They made sense at the time. But you have to catch them. Otherwise, they're just going to stay around. Okay? So seems very easy. Anger is the wish to harm. <laughs> okay? Um, what does it mean to stop anger? Let me just sit with that. What does it mean to stop anger? Like it's too late, you're rattled, you're rumbling, you're boiling, you are mad. And you might be restraining yourself from saying or doing anything, but you want to. The wish to harm is there, even if the action of harm isn't there. How do you stop it? And from a Buddhist perspective, there's just kind of like twofold strategy, really practical. First, don't feed it. <laughs> yeah, Don't feed it with belief or justification when it arises. Don't suppress it or deny its presence in your mind. Those are the two things that we have to keep in mind. Now, not to feed it with belief and justification and not to suppress it or deny it kind of implies that part of you knows it's not the right thing. So you're kind of trying to reassure yourself that you're still good by saying, it's only fair that I'm angry. Look at what they did, look at what they said, look at how they are. Because part of you knows it's not really the right way to be. So you're trying to justify why it should stay. Or you think I shouldn't feel this way, so I'm gonna pretend I don't. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't feel this way, so I don't feel this way. La 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 la, I'm gonna you know, water the garden and you know, go into a dissociative state or I don't know, some sort of behavior that's either healthy or unhealthy, but you're just squashing it. Right. So it's natural that we would want to self-soothe by saying it's only fair that I feel this way or I'm going to pretend I don't feel this way because I want to be a good person. OK, but what we want to do is get a bit deeper and remember that for the first one, observations can be correct, but the specific response of anger is more optional than we allow. Okay, so we normally would feed our anger with belief and justification. What we're trying to say is some of the things we say to ourselves when we're angry are true observations. They did do that. They did say that. This is happening. You're not wrong. But your conclusion is, therefore, they must be punished. <laughs> or therefore, they must be excluded. Or therefore, they must be dominated. Or therefore, therefore, therefore. It's the therefore that's under question, not the observation. And that's sometimes where we get stuck because it's like we're, it feels like we're saying we can't see what we've seen. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, microphone. Okay, there's this expression righteous anger. Righteous anger, yes. So, where does that come from? I mean, uh, I do. Think righteous anger. You think that there is righteous anger. How would you define it? How would you define righteous anger? If I see something which is really horribly wrong, mm -hmm. you know, I will feel anger. Do I want to lash out? No. But, you know, I feel like this is painful. Yeah, you want it to stop. You want yeah. the bad behavior to stop. And you're agitated yeah. that harm is happening. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So absolutely. So there is righteous anger. Yeah. Well, we would say uh, there are many things happening simultaneously. Some of them are accurate, good observations. Some of them are not, right? So to see harm happening 
and to want that harm to stop, good, yeah, excellent. But we seem to think that anger is necessary in order to be motivated to save things or to help people. Anger is not necessary for that, it's just natural, right? It's habitual. It's habitual, it's, it, and it might have worked well at some point here and there, but just be a little objective for a sec, okay? Just like, don't think about a personal example, think of like a historical example, and think that things done under the influence of quote, righteous anger may fix a problem, but it's usually short-lived and there's a backlash and the cycle of violence continues, yeah? So, but then what would you feel if you feel certain atrocities? Feel what you feel, right? Feel what you feel, but don't feed the agitation because the agitation doesn't help you problem solve. This is the thing. So it can be natural, but that doesn't mean it's necessary. It can be understandable, but that doesn't mean we need to have that response. It's just a conditioned response. And so if initially when you see harm happening, and you feel agitated and that makes you want to dig more deeply into how to prevent harm okay use that to get off your bum but don't keep relying on an agitated mind to make you care about things why because you'll burn out why because it's short-term benefit not long-term benefit it's almost like you have to say i care so much about this i'm going to work on my anger because it's so important that I need all of my tools accessible to me. I need every tool that I've ever come across in my whole life and all of the relationships in my life and all of the resources and tools I can con contact to be ready there for me. And if I'm angry, I'm gonna alienate people who might be resources. I'm going to cloud my judgment and not have as many of my own personal skills accessible. So you say to yourself, it's understandable I'm upset it's understandable that I'm angry, but if this is really important to me, I need to go deeper than this. I need to be bigger than my knee jerk response. So we would say righteous anger is understandable, but not to be developed. Yeah, that it's just to be, you know, to say it very kindly as someone who has a lot of quote righteous anger, it's immature, it's not mature. And we all do it and it's completely, you know, supported in society, all activist communities look at how rallies go, but you can have passion without it being agitated. You can have energy without it costing you relationships and costing you creativity. So that's what we're really trying to look at with what is patience. Does it, does it make sense or do you have stuck spots? I have some, you know, me, like, anger. can can you hold the microphone up? For me, anger is like a jumping board. You know that what gets you into action. Sometimes. Yeah, anger is is the jumping board that gets you into action. Yeah. Um, it can be. Does it have to be? You know, is there another way? Is there a way to even see the disadvantage of that way? Yeah, we many of us were taught if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. Many of us were taught this, right? Many of us were taught the personal is political and you must see it that way or you will never be motivated for positive social environmental change, et cetera, or to solve you know, problematic family dynamics or workplace toxicity or blah, blah, blah. But assertiveness is not anger. Passion is not anger. We're just used to mixing them all together. The problem of anger is that it leads to suffering your own suffering in the future because of the karmic seeds and because of the poison you're spewing everywhere under the heading of doing the right thing. So, you know, forgive yourself for being motivated in a less mature way in the past. We all were, we were taught to, but now that we're meeting a spiritual path, let's do better. Maybe I'm getting, I use the word anger when it is not, you know, what you are talking about, you know. Yeah, and that's the point is we're talking about the wish to harm when we say anger. Yeah. yeah. So maybe then I, but I think this anger, maybe it's not this, you know, because I do not associate anger with harm from anger. 
Yeah, you don't, yeah, you don't want to harm anybody, and that's so that's maybe key. I'm just yeah, maybe, and it's worth sitting with because I think it's usually mixed. Whenever we're trying to do a good thing with assertiveness, we're just used to waiting until we're grumpy about it. You know, it's something we saw and observed and thought was not ideal for quite a while, and we wait until we're just really pissed, and then we do something. It's a habit, and it's something that we want to work on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the chat, let's see. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Angel. So did anyone want to ask any more about just kind of the definition of anger from a Buddhist perspective or this uh, ways to stop it that are healthy, not problematic? You with me so far? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That oh, sorry, I, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. Um... Sometimes anger is like a fuel, as you said, and even if it's for a good cause, like when somebody is burning himself or you, you know that it's a bad thing to do and you, you go to make them like with adolescents or with children uh, and you are angry because you, you want them to stop doing that, even if sometimes it doesn't work but you want to shock them somehow, it's for a good reason. Is it creating a bad karma? Like it's, it cannot be in all this um, situation, a bad seed, right? You're, you're mixing a behavior with an intention. You're mixing them as if the outer behavior of anger is one thing and the inner um, conversation and the inner intention was the same. So that if you grab a child who's about to put their hand in the fire and you grab them abruptly and it kind of squishes them a little bit and they're not totally comfortable, but they need to not be burned. That's not an action of anger. That's just a strong action. But your mind is compassion. You don't want them to hurt themselves, right? You could say something really, really sweet, but your intention is to wound. All right, so make sure you're not mixing the behavior with the intention. Yeah. Because what plants the negative karma is mm -hmm. your intention. Right? So, so just make sure that in your mind you're like, all right, there's the behaviors and then there's the mentality. The mentality needs to get in alignment. And then whatever I say or do can synchronize with that. Sometimes it'll be sweet. Sometimes it'll be peaceful. Sometimes it'll be strong. Sometimes it'll be assertive, but it has to start from forbearance with suffering. Yeah, not responding to the suffering of someone or your own pain with a wish to harm, with a wish to retaliate, with a wish to punish. You're able to yeah, bear but pain. In, 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 in like education, uh, long time ago even uh, now on in our days in education you as you said you mixed up attention is always good but you go too far or the father is a um, authority uh, like uh, image of authority or and it's go all go mixed up and Bring yeah, suffering to the child. Yeah, yeah. Like it's the, the intention was good. No, you're you're making it sound like if your heart was in the right place at the beginning, that it continues to be in the right place all the way yeah. to the end. And there's a million moments of mind. Every second your mind is changing. So yeah. the seconds that your mind were, I don't want to harm, I want them to be free from suffering. I'm going to speak to them loudly to get their attention. Okay, maybe argument, yeah, no problem. And then it turns because your, your louder voice isn't working because as it turns out, when you yell at people, they don't listen, <laughs> right? But you're frustrated because that was your plan, right? I need them to listen, so I'm gonna yell, right? And you got frustrated and then it turned from compassion and intention to be patient. It turned into, you must be dominated child because you're not submitting to my authority. And then it is negative karma. And, and this is the ego, ego coming in, yes. in between, yeah. Ego co-opted your beautiful plan, <laughs> as so often it does, right? So often it does, yeah. thank you. Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah, Charity, did you have one? No, done, okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, look, like we can get on board logically, I think fairly easily. It's just then life, how does this work? And you have to really exercise very bold, very brave self-awareness. How does my anger hurt me? You know, how does my anger hurt me? Of course it hurts other people. I feel all sorts of guilt and shame and justification around how I've hurt others because of my anger. Sure, but also look at how anger hurts you. Ruins your digestion, right? Makes you break out in pimples. All sorts of wrinkles are happening. Lots of problems. Yes, cancer, all the things. Who knows what, what anger does? It does all sorts of terrible things to you. Yes, and you know the old saying, right? Anger is like... I don't know, taking poison and expecting the other person to die, right? You know that saying? One of my favorites. Yeah, it really, anger is not good for you. Yeah, it hurts you. It blocks your good heart. Yeah. Um, Charity? I keep putting my hand down because I was thinking about what that lady said about righteous anger and um, my upbringing has me very familiar with this term, righteous anger. And um, in analyzing my own toxicity, I realized that being righteously angry about something is really about how right I am. So um, it ties in directly with, you know, some habits of black and white, right and wrong. And um, maybe it's just helpful to remember, oh, I'm really caught up in my sense of being right right now. So yeah. maybe that can help. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you're saying something really important there. That is, that's a very important point because sometimes the righteousness is actually just I'm rightness. Yeah, sometimes that feeling of come what may, I will, I will prove my point, but you kind of lost even the mission of the point because now you've identified with it. So even if you get new information that would normally make you change your opinion, you can't hear it because you've made it all about you winning. Yeah, and we do this a million times in a life. And so this is a very important point you brought up for sure. Yeah, yeah, so Nam John. So how do we develop our awareness so we can stop anger from taking a hold of us? I guess is my question. Well, funny you should ask. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, no, it's very really important because it's, it's all well and good to kind of name the beast, but then what do you do with it, right? And honestly, again and again, self-awareness is almost not always but like when things are small sometimes self-awareness is enough to pierce through and dissolve it once you've thought about it right so right now what we're doing is developing the wisdom of hearing and the wisdom of contemplation and so we're thinking about these ideas we're just thinking about them intellectually and then we're thinking about them a little bit experientially related to our own habits and hopefully there's a few moments of, oh yeah, I do that. Oh yeah, that's not totally healthy. Yep, that's a little problematic. There's just little you know, flickers of self-awareness, which means that your self-awareness is conditioned by that. So then when you're walking around in your daily life with just bodhicitta mindfulness, you know, mindfulness with an agenda of working towards enlightenment, you can notice when your mind starts to veer off into anger. You can notice when it's starting to stray. And that's why we have mindfulness. It's not a passive mindfulness of I am walking, I am sitting, I am eating, like who cares? Yeah. <laughs> like it will help you have concentration and that is a good thing. But passive mindfulness is not our approach in this tradition. It's bodhicitta mindfulness. So you keep conditioning your mindfulness with what are, am I watching for? What am I watching for? I'm watching to see where I fall off my path to enlightenment. And anger is one of the ways I fall off my path to enlightenment. Patience is one of the ways I stay on my path to enlightenment and develop it to its utmost extent. So you don't have to be thinking that in all sorts of big verbose paragraphs. You th you're thinking about them in big verbose paragraphs now while we're all hanging out talking. But then in your life, you're just thinking, patience, good, anger, bad you know just make it nice and simple but it's now that all those very simple words have more loading they have more power and so they have a better ability to catch you when you're starting to stray so self-awareness is the main thing to prevent you from getting anger 
particularly when you've been studying and thinking about it a lot. There are other strategies. So, you know, kind of break it into before I get angry, what? While I'm angry, what? After I've been angry, what? And break it into chunks. So before you get angry, mindfulness. Bodhicitta mindfulness will prevent you from getting angry. Problem is we can't be mindful all the time because our concentration hasn't been perfected. So as mindful as you can be is as much as you can prevent your anger. And then you'll get distracted because you're a human being, no problem. Anger will arise just as bad as it ever was probably. Yeah, and you'll be like, oh, how embarrassing. I'm a spiritual practitioner, but I really want to punch them in the face. Oh, embarrassing. Yeah. And hopefully you have enough self-awareness to be amused at your own hypocrisy, to be amused at your own inconsistencies and say, oh, okay, that's not my path. Let's not feed it. Let's not suppress it. Let's just let it roll through like the tidal wave it is. Because no negative emotion will stay if it's unfed. It will die a natural death. It will die a natural death. So that's your during anger process, right? Your during anger plan is just watch it without feeding it, without suppressing it. Which is the same advice as in meditation with any thought, right? It's not like a whole brand new advice. When you're sitting on your meditation cushion, interesting distraction, problematic distraction, dharma distraction, all distractions, notice, don't suppress, don't feed, come back to your meditation object, right? So what you do on your cushion is the same as what you do in your life. It's just a slightly different format, yeah? So anger is there, you're watching it roll through, trying to you know, keep your mouth shut and your hands to yourself until the <laughs> storm passes, yeah? And don't send any emails and don't write any text messages, <laughs> right? Don't buy anything, just you know, do something that is maybe tactile and grounding while the storm passes. If you're too wound up to meditate on the mind or the breath, if you're too agitated, just do something physical while the storm passes. Yeah, it could be knitting, right? It doesn't have to be like suddenly go to the gym, just, you know, knitting, sketching, you know, if you write in your journal, you probably start writing about what you're angry about and just reinforce it. While you're angry, seems like the funnest time to write in your journal. Don't do it then, right? It'll be entertaining, but actually better to write about it after the storm passes. Yeah, so once the storm has passed, you might want to write down a few reflections of, I think the trigger was this. And I think the missed opportunity to catch it in its infancy was at that point or that point. Yeah, if I had mindfulness at breakfast when I was starting to get grumpy, that mindfulness enough might have been enough to prevent this anger. But I missed that window. I just kind of let myself be grumpy because I'm used to being grumpy in the morning. You know, so you're doing like a post anger analysis once you've settled down. Yeah. So before, during, after. But yeah, did you have a follow up question about that? Yeah, just a quick follow up. If we, if we wanted to develop this skill faster, is it helpful to <laughs> put ourselves in situations where we get angry or? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's masochism, John. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> just teasing. Um, I don't know what masochists get up to, you know, just be safe. Okay, so um, no, don't do that. What you do do though, is you can go back to previous anger events in your life, use your memory. So if you wanna get this done faster, do lots of analytical meditation on patients and we'll do one after the break. So, you know, there's a lot of formats for it, but if there was ever an outline to look at in the Lam Rim Chenmo, the outline on patience is just the most beautiful guided meditation. And any one of those points you could sit with for five minutes, five days, five years, they're amazing and pithy. So it's volume two of the great treatise of the stages of the path to enlightenment by Lama Tsongkhapa. That patience section is amazing. It really, it changed my life. It's so cool. But you don't, you know, if you're not kind of a, a bookie kind of person or a like Tibetan scholar kind of person, there's the gentle shorter ways that we'll be doing in class here and you just repeat them 
once you get used to the format from me leading you, then you lead yourself. So like a guided meditation, you might have some experiences, but really a guided meditation is to train you so that you can do it by yourself. So, you know, just kind of go over it until you can do it by yourself and you'll be using your memories of times when you really lost your cool as your examples of ways to play with and work on your anger. Yeah. Yeah, so if you, have, if you want to be efficient, more meditation will make this happen more quickly. Yeah, I'm um, Christina. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm realizing that in anger can be unpacked quite a bit. Um, and I had no idea that the that Buddhism, I've been studying Buddhism for a really long time. I had no idea that the definition of anger in Buddhism was not to cause harm. So in just this short bit that I've been listening to you um, speak on anger, the curiosity comes to mind, like, uh, well, is every time that I get, get angry, like, is it is it with the intent to cause harm? And, and then it's like, I think, well, you know, in some of the sharings that people have shared, it's like, I'm, I'm analyzing, I'm thinking, is that, is that, is that, are, are we trying to cause harm in that situation? Or am I trying to ca cause harm? And I guess what I'm, I'm wanted to ask you is that ultimately, if I'm, the anger is arising from ego or the self-cherishing or whatever the reason it's, it's really usually comes from some sort of like out of my ego, then is just by the chance that I'm operating from my ego, it's called, is that by ultimately causing harm just because I'm, I'm operating from that place? Well, I mean, we're always operating from like a mild to moderate indifference to others. And then it sometimes escalates into wish to harm or wish to possess or, you know, many forms of objectifying other people. But if we're really honest, you know, shelf cherishing is driving all the time unless we consciously correct it to bodhicitta or loving kindness or compassion or peace. We have to consciously correct it. Otherwise, our default session setting is me first. And it could be like a gentle and passive me first that's like trying not to cause any trouble, but is a little indifferent to the wake we leave behind us. Or it could be like an elbowing our way through me first where like we know we're hurting people and we're kind of delighted, you know, <laughs> you know, but always there is like this like me first thing. And so, you know, the conscious correction, that's what we're working on our whole life. But when anger just kind of pops out of nowhere and you catch it when it's quite small, because sometimes we do just flare into anger because of imprints and extremely strong habituation. If you don't give in, that some there's very little negative karma created if you don't give in. Yeah. And if you correct it with patience, you're creating huge positive karma right on the back of it that you might not have created without it kind of reminding you like a little mindfulness spell. You know, like you got kind of like poked in your brain and you're like, ah, and you're like, oh no, oh, 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 claws back down, retract the claws, you know, and then for all sentient things, for all sentient things. So time, sometimes those little like spikes of anger out of nowhere, those can be like a mindfulness bell to just come back to your motivation. And you don't even need to think anything bad about it at all. You can just be like, oh, that's why I need to practice because that just comes so naturally without even thinking about it. You know, just a little bit of low blood sugar, just a few hours, not enough of sleep, and then anger is just so quick. That's why I have to practice. So you're not excusing it, you're not denying it. You're just like, oh yeah, I see you, I see you. But yeah, if you don't give in, it's very minor karma. Yeah, it's more an imprint flare. Yeah, Paige. Well, thank you. Um, it's really useful to hear this discussion. I think one of the hardest things for me is to catch the anger when it actually first arises, because it's so rapid. It's it's within a split second. It's, it's too late almost by the time you realize you're anger, angry. So um, it's like you've got to slow everything absolutely down to to see that anger spiking. And yeah. so for me, it feels like patience is, is learning how to slow everything down so that you're not reacting with the anger too quickly. You know, yeah. it's like the anger comes up and then your action comes on it almost instantaneously. Yeah, absolutely. It's strong enough. 
And it's very hard to stop it and say, oh, wait, I'm angry. So yeah. I have a choice on how I can express this anger. You do have a choice. You know, you can decide you want to yell. You can decide you want to run. You can decide you want to be quiet. You can decide lots of different things. There's lots of different actions you can take. But it's so hard to realize that at that moment, the anger comes up. You have a choice in how to express it and how to express it in a way that's least harmful to yourself. Yeah, I also so keep thinking of non-duality, so I keep on thinking of there is no duality in, in reality. So any anger that you feel is automatically going to hurt yourself. If you're not hurting, if you're not hitting someone else, it's automatically going to impact you because it's a non-dual kind of situation. Well, it's sort of like you're slapping your own self, yeah. <laughs> you know, and your hand's like, I'm not hurt, you know, but you know, <laughs> it's attached to the body that your hand is a part of, yeah. you know. So. Well, that, that's been my problem is that I've been hurting myself all my life with anger and with all these reactions. And, and I'm just going, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this to myself? Innate ignorance, join the club, not to fear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not to fear, join the club yeah but, but i mean honestly the fact that we can that we can recognize it right and that is the best yeah. news otherwise we would just be like if we were animals it there's not a lot of mental space to change you know and yeah. you know the nice thing about animals is just by living their nature they don't cause too much harm to the planet us we have this intelligence which can adjust problematic behaviors, but also when we don't, the, the harm is far worse, mm -hmm. right? So if we were actually animals, maybe it'd be no big deal, but we're not. And so if we just live by our animal instincts of acquire, get, protect, mate, punish, fight, if we just let ourselves be animals, we ruin the world. So we have this human intelligence, we need to use this human intelligence, it's our birthright, but it's also our responsibility because all the ways, you know, the world's gonna keep getting worse. And if you believe in future lives, we'll just inherit a hotter, horrible, you know, more war-torn planet. Is our mind gonna be stable enough to deal with those conditions without reactivity? You know, so this is what we want to keep thinking about is what is the legacy we want to leave our future self as well as kids and, you know, younger generations and humanity as a whole, but also what do we want to leave for ourselves. So the non duality issue is going to come up with looking at anger for sure so put a pin in that because that certainly comes up. Yeah. Um, but I think if we want to just look at this last point again and then we'll have a break. Um, let's see. So this not to suppress it or deny its presence in your mind. This is this key thing of to remember the disadvantages of anger itself. Okay, so this means you have to have enough objectivity to not go into the story of why. Because there's a million reasons to be angry. You could be angry right now if you thought about it long enough. You could find something to be angry about if you wanted to. You could do an analytical meditation on how to be angry, bring it up in your mind, hold your attention on it, be super angry. You know, so it's not about the story of the anger. It's about anger. So you take an example, say you're having a conflict with a human right? Some human is being obnoxious and harmful to you or to someone you love. And it's one of those rare cases where they're a hundred percent in the wrong and you're a hundred percent in the right. Imagine it's one of those magic cases that never happens, but they really are doing the wrong thing. And you're thinking about all the reasons why they're wrong and you're getting all worked up. Drop the story and look at what anger is doing to you. Say, the story of my observations I can return to and problem solve about in a few minutes, in a few minutes. But if I keep going over and over the story, I'm re-stimulating the anger. So let me just kind of like feel the story like this, you know, clenched fist and just kind of drop it. Just drop the story and turn and look into, wow, my breath is getting short. My face is getting hot. My hands are shaking. My body is not loving this emotion. <laughs> I have an intoxicant in my system that is really unsettling. I don't want this. 
I don't function well from this. Look at the disadvantage of anger itself. Yeah, and then you think about in the past, when I've spoken from this place, it felt so necessary. It felt so true the last time I spoke from this place. And then when I settled down and when I had hindsight, mm -hmm. I realized I re overreacted. I realized that I was not taking into account a whole other side of things or picture of things. And even if I did, maybe my response was too pointed, too arrow-like, too much of a weapon. So you remember how certain anger feels when you give into it and how embarrassed you are when you settle down at how you behaved. Because when wisdom reasserts itself, you really do cringe and you're like, how could I have said that? How could I have done that? That was not me. And it wasn't, it was an affliction. Remind yourself that you know that. Yeah, that wasn't me, that was anger. Just like, that wasn't me, that was the alcohol. Yeah, it's not you. <laughs> so don't identify with it, don't keep it. It's not your protector, it's not your friend. We might be used to it being our protector and friend, and that is important to acknowledge. Yeah, it might have been the thing that made us assertive. It might have been the thing that made us speak up or said something sarcastic and sassy to someone who wanted to tear us down. It might have once acted like a protector in this limited way, but what it really did was keep you even more closed in and isolated and alienated from the rest of humanity. Yeah, it just closed the walls in and it made you even more the center of the universe, but a painful, sad and isolated center of the universe with no one to connect to. It was not a happy center. Yeah, it was a narrowed focus. So you remember what anger has done to you in the past. Yeah, and that sometimes if you can drop the story, but remember the, the dysfunction of anger, that's enough for you to say, okay, let's not feed it. All the things I'm saying to myself, I can say to myself in 10, 20 minutes if I need to, but not when I'm under the influence of this, not now. And even neuroscientists would agree, if you don't feed a negative emotion, they actually don't last that long. Yeah, if you say, how about I just don't do anything for five minutes about this anger? Yeah, in terms of an action of body speech. How about I just keep myself from hurting anyone for five minutes? I keep myself from going over the story for five minutes and then just see. Because sometimes the edge will be significantly off, yeah? Yeah, we're sometimes used to trying to talk ourselves out of anger but we have to understand anger is analytical so it, that your very analytical abilities will turn against you with anger. So don't try and analyze yourself out of anger when you're angry. Do that to prevent anger, do that as a follow-up once you've been angry, but in the middle of the anger, just shut up to yourself, to everyone else, just shut it. Yeah, because you're not going to have anything good to say that won't be co-opted by anger and then escalated into. Does that make sense? Does that ring true from your experience? Mm -hmm. You're in there? Yeah, Teresa. Like. Uh, no. Okay. I think um, what I'm noticing is exactly what you're saying, that when I try to analyze and I'm angry, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So I like this idea of, I mean, it's good to not say anything or do anything, but it's also suddenly I'm realizing, oh, when I try to think my way out of it, it just doesn't work. So it's better to just do nothing at all. <laughs> I like the way you say, stop talking to yourself and to other people. Speaking from experience, <laughs> don't say anything. <laughs> yeah, did you do something? Oh, no, just holding. So, you know, use what you already know. Yeah, use it on purpose, use it repeatedly and catch this sucker, you know, really catch it because it wants to co op your analysis. It wants to co op what seems like wisdom. It says it's your protection and it's not. It's your isolator, you know, it's your alienator. Yeah. 
and then it's what makes you into the harmer. So don't give in. And if you do forgive yourself and move on, that's the thing. If you do give in and you are angry, don't let it be this toxic stew of sadness and guilt and justification. Just say, whoops, back on the path. Not on something? Sorry, I was disconnected. I, I tried to come back again and again, but now I'm, thank you, I, I hear you. Okay, okay, so we'll have five minute break oh, and we'll do the freeze meditation. again. We'll, we'll do- Maybe I cut my video. <laughs> oh, you're frozen, Ladan. I think it's your connection. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. So five minute break then meditation. <laughs>
Okay, everybody come back. All right, so now we'll do a meditation and I'm gonna use that Lam Rim outline that I talked about earlier. Excuse me, um, so it's gonna be on the screen. You don't need to read it, but if it helps you to have a visual prompt, it's gonna be there, but I'll be reading it to you so you could just keep your eyes closed and just listen deeply, but the words will be there on the screen in case you get lost. Okay, so just first of all, nice straight back. Getting recentered into your posture. Couple deep breaths. And reground yourself in your space. So because it's later in the day and easier to get tired, we'll start with the bottom up. So start with the experience of your legs and feet. And the experience of your hips. And just feel the weight of that lower part of your body where it contacts the ground or the chair. Just be with the physical experience. And if the lower part of your body needs to shift, let it shift. If you need to stabilize by moving forward or back to find your balance, do so. See if you can find that very stable base so that it's not a strain to be upright. and moving your focus up through the belly, allowing the stomach to be very soft and relaxed with nothing clenched or held. and up into your lungs. And without any kind of pressure or strain, see if you can invite your lungs to breathe all the way down into your stomach. and relaxing up the hands and arms and shoulders. Releasing tension where you find it. and up through the throat and neck, all the way up into the head, just bringing balance, steadiness, letting go of tightness or tension.
and then revive your motivation by saying to yourself, may I examine and understand my own habits of anger in order to develop the perfection of patience all the way to its utmost extent, including enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. As I understand my own patterns of anger, may I come into closer contact with the practice of patience. This is for myself. This is for others. This is for now. This is for the future. And so start by asking yourself the question, what does it mean to stop anger? And so first think about when you stopped anger in a way that you know was not healthy. Suppression or avoidance, maybe it turned inward into depression. But first just ask what's the wrong way to stop anger? You individually, what's not worked, not been healthy? And so you use that self-knowledge and you remind yourself that stopping anger while something you do want to do, you don't want to do it like that. Not blocking it, suppressing it, not pretending it's not there, not turning it inward on yourself. not disassociated from it and not calling it something that it isn't. And so then ask yourself, what is the right way to stop anger? What's been useful for you in your life? You were able to diffuse it in some way, bring patience to it in some way. What has worked so far?
When you've been angry and you've caught yourself, did it help to use humor? Maybe it helped to use physical activity. Maybe it helped to be still. What's helped? Give your own wisdom back to yourself. And then we reinforce our awareness that to stop anger means to not feed it with belief, justification. Remember that the observations can be correct, but the specific response of anger is more optional than we allow. It doesn't need to be our conclusion. And so picture yourself getting angry and the kinds of trains of thought that you have when you do justify it when you try to explain yourself to yourself why it's only right you should feel this way. That whole internal monologue. Imagine how you get. And then imagine what words you could say to yourself that would interrupt that. That would break the pattern. That would let it dissolve. What would you say? Rehearse, really think about it. What would stop you from saying the same old sorts of things? How would you remind yourself of your own wisdom or the wisdom that you've integrated from the Dharma? And maybe some days it feels too hard or too new to change the narrative. So maybe we could take inspiration from masters in the past like Shantideva. And Shantideva says, unruly beings are as unlimited as space. They cannot possibly all be overcome. But if I overcome thoughts of anger alone, this would be equivalent to vanquishing all foes. Where would I possibly find enough leather with which to cover the surface of the earth, but wearing 
leather just on the soles of my shoes is equivalent to covering the earth with it. Likewise, it is not possible for me to restrain the external course of things, but should I restrain this mind of mine, what would be the need to restrain all else? And so think that all of this wisdom is embodied by the mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum. And that you say it to yourself and radiate it out to the universe, reinforcing these ideas, deepening them. Om Mani Padme Hum. 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 And imagine that this compassionate wisdom continues to reverberate within you, as well as radiating out. And we dedicate, may the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. May the precious few of emptiness that is not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Okay. So thank you everyone. And um, we'll continue with patience next, next week, a little bit more on uh, dealing with our responses to people. And then we'll move on into dealing with our responses to physical and mental suffering and the others. So if you're having interesting ideas come up, um, write them down, don't lose them, and we can talk about it next week. <laughs>